Almost 1,000 years ago, a new religious order began in Europe with St. Norbert. But today, there are some Norbertines carrying on his ancient tradition in the quiet, sedate, and austere surroundings of Southern California. <laughs> like totally, dude. Tonight, we'll hear how seven Hungarian cannons exploded into 70 Americans. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Uh, before I go to introduce my guests, I just want to mention that I just returned from Australia on Monday night. And I, I was just so impressed with the way that the Australians love EWTN. They love Mother Angelica so much and they're watching in great numbers. People would recognize me, you know, in the, the streets and stuff even. And a lot of people came out to the conferences and talks that I was giving because they just w were enamored with what we've done here. And they were very supportive, too. Many of them gave very nice donations to help the network. So it was a great, great trip and a great chance to talk to them and encourage them to evangelize their own country of Australia. So if you ever get a chance to get down to Australia, go ahead and do so. And one of my recommendations, buy the licorice. It's really good. But you can tell where I, my mind is. All right. Tonight we have a couple of guests who come from a growing religious order of nearly 70 men. Now please welcome from St. Michael's Abbey of the Norbertine Fathers, Abbot Eugene Hayes and Father James Smith. <laughs> Abbot, please welcome. Father Smith. Thank you. Well, it's nice to have both of you here. I have been familiar with your abbey for a long time. Uh, I've given a lot of talks in Southern California, and your abbey is one of those shining stars in, in that area. There's not everybody in California would be a committed Catholic. Would that be agreed on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you guys are doing great, great work Thank there. You. Thank you. But before we go into what your own monastery, first of all, tell us a little bit, who was St. Norbert? You're named the Norbertines or the Premont's Detentions. First, tell us who St. Norbert was. St. Norbert was born in northern Germany in the year 1080. He was originally destined for a career in the church, so he was ordained subdeacon. But he was not leading a holy life of a subdeacon. He was uh -huh. not leading a holy Christian life at all until he was 35 years old. And then God sent to him a lightning bolt. A lightning bolt. Now, Literally. there's an attention getter. Literally. <laughs> knocked him to the ground, knocked God's sense into his heart, and he realized that was a sign from God for him <laughs> to convert, to receive the grace of God's conversion, which he did. Then he was ordained a deacon and then a priest, and he went on a retreat in a nearby Benedictine abbey, and discerned, first of all, that he was called, he had a vocation from God to be a wandering preacher throughout Europe, preaching the gospel and preaching repentance and penance. He got permission from the Pope himself to preach anywhere and everywhere that he wanted to. So he immediately, like any holy person or saint, began to gather followers some of them followed him around. Some of them expected him uh, gladly into their towns and villages. And gradually he discerned that he was to be a founder of a new religious order. And his sponsor was Bishop Bartholomew of Laon, France, who found a place for him in a little lonely valley called Pre-Montre, 
So we are the order. So premonstrance attention does not mean that you are kneeling before a monstrance. We do that too, but you that's do that not too, the meaning of the word. But that's not the, the meaning of the word. The word means we were founded in the valley of Premontre, France, in 1120. And originally there were 13 professions made on Christmas night in that little valley. And then the, the order grew because people were longing for holiness, for holy priests, for holy people. St. Norbert was a very holy priest and realized that the church needed holy priests because of some abuses going on at that time. So as he traveled around Europe preaching, he founded monasteries and convents for Norbertine priests and sisters. And he ended up as the Archbishop of the city of Magdeburg, Germany, Mm -hmm. for the last eight years of his life. And he died there in Magdeburg on June 6th in the year 1134. So one of the things that's a perennial need, because uh, there's a certain parallel to someone like St. Francis or St. Ignatius, that there was a, a desire for preaching and raising up an order that would go out to the folks and preach the gospel plainly to them. This was one of the great gifts that your order, the Norbertines, gave to the church of the 12th century. St. Norbert was a great preacher, a very convincing preacher, actually. Uh, The grace of God worked through him very evidently. He also was a man of peace. He was a peacemaker. One of his gifts from God was the ability to reconcile individuals and groups of people, for example, families who were feuding, literally killing each other for years. Sometimes. Sort of the European version of Hatfield and McCoy. Yes, <clears throat> yeah. yes. Now, this, this is something that's really continued to grow because your order still exists. But, yes. Abbott, you are not a monk, are you? No, we are canons. And uh-huh. as What's can- the difference? Well, <clears throat> we are canons regular, so we are priests who live under a rule, the rule of St. Augustine, the constitutions, and different from uh, the monk, obviously ordination, uh, we're, we are a clerical order. So and that means that all, all the members would be all priests? The, all the members are priests, although there are brothers in mm-hmm. some, some abbeys, and as canons, our life is centered around liturgical prayer. Uh, solemn celebration of the Eucharist, but also the liturgy of the hours throughout the day and night. And because canons originally had the role of uh, being in a cathedral right, right. to chant the office right. and mm-hmm. celebrate the Eucharist. Right, right. And so that's the, the, the continuation, continuity is there. But what the difference is between us and those canons that you mentioned is that we are canons regular living under a rule, living a common life. So it has nothing to do with your diet? No. Not that kind no, of regular? not at all, not at all. So, <clears throat> so this is, so you, just from the Latin word for rule, regular. Regular, right. And so, so that's what makes you regular as, right. as opposed to those who are non-regular. Yeah. So uh, at any rate, so you've got this rule and your canon, so celebration of the liturgy is, is very important. Right. And the liturgy of the hours is, is key, but you're not monks. No. Okay. No. Uh, Father mentioned how quickly the order grew, and by 60 years after the foundation at uh, Premontre, there was a community founded in Hungary, uh, Chorna, C S O R N A, and that is the mother abbey of St. Michael's Abbey in Southern California. Okay. In the history of that community, there were three or four times where the community had been suppressed, uh, and then. In Hungary. In Hungary, and then came back. Uh, to uh, to life uh, <clears throat> in the late 1940s uh, after the Second World War, the communist government or the communists got into the government, and one of the first things they decided to do was to suppress all of the religious schools because they wanted the hearts sure. and of the, minds of, of the, the young people. Yeah. And our apostolate from 1800 was education. Cardinal Minzenti was a student of one of our Norbertine schools. And Cardinal Minzenti, a lot of folks don't remember him, but give us briefly who he was. He was the primate of Hungary, and uh, he was uh, primate during 
the 40s into the 50s. Uh, he was a promoter of the church, a defender of her privileges and of the faith, and he was imprisoned. Uh, he was harassed by the Nazis when they had uh, taken over the Hungarian government, and then when the communists came in, they also uh, persecuted him to the point where he was imprisoned. And in 1956, when there was that brief period of freedom for the Hungarian uh, people, one of the first things they did was that they went and uh, freed him. Uh, and he was received as, uh, as a great hero, great patriot. And then, of course, uh, the Russians came in, and Karnaman Sandy took refuge in the American embassy right. in Budapest. And he was there, I think, until 69, 70, yeah, wait, when wait. he was uh, able to come out. I was actually <clears throat> privileged to go to his grave. It's at a Marian shrine Maria in Zell. Maria Zell in uh, uh, Austria. Austria. Okay. And so, yeah. In 1974, he came and visited our community okay. uh, in Hungary and presided at the, the graduation and the graduation mass that year. Uh, so back to Chorna in 1950, <clears throat> uh, the government, having suppressed the schools, then decided that they would suppress all of the monasteries. And any religious who were not priests in parishes uh, were at, in, in danger. In June of 1950, an alumnus of one of our schools came to the abbot, the abbot of Chorna, and said, the date is set on such and such a date. The armed forces will turn up at all these monasteries and everyone there will be arrested. And so the abbot announced that to the community and two priests came forward and they said, we would like to try to escape to the West and then come back. Uh, the thought was the communist uh, period wouldn't last more than 10 years. And sort so of the way they <laughs> thought about the Nazi period. That right. was just exactly. six years right. or so. Right. So the, the communists will come to an end as well. Right. So uh, uh, they fled uh, eight uh, eight uh, priests fled in two groups uh, across the border. They went to the, the uh, Hungarian border with Austria uh, under the cover of night. They went through a field. They swam a river. They cut through barbed wire and arrived in the Russian-occupied uh, area of Austria where there, were, uh, there was a farmer there with a hay cart, and he drove them into the British zone of Vienna, and that was how they, they got out. 1956, with the revolution, they realized that there would not be an easy uh, return to Hungary, that the communists were in for a while, and so they came to the United States, and in 1957, Cardinal McIntyre, uh, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, welcomed them into the archdiocese, and they began to teach, but at the same time, uh, they began to search for a place uh, to buy, to, to set up uh, a new St. Michael's, so in 1961, uh, August 15th, uh, St. Michael's Junior Seminary and uh, Novitiate opened, which was the beginning of, the, of our abbey. So next year, beginning on August 15th, we will have a jubilee year uh, celebrating uh, 50 years of great growth, as you mentioned, seven uh, canons now with the community number is 70, almost 70. And that's what I meant by cannons. I wasn't talking about any right. of the war during the Hungarian Revolution. It had nothing to do with that, but one it was... In, one end, not two ends. <laughs> yes, right. So um, uh, in, on August 27th, we will receive uh, eight postulants, uh, and our median age at this point is 41, and God continues to bless 41. us. 41. Now, th th that's significant because the median age of, I think, most of the men's orders is 65. 60s. And yeah. the sisters higher. And sisters, is, for nuns, it's even higher. It's yeah. probably in the <clears throat> low 70s by now. Yeah. So it's, uh, to have a median age in 41, uh, you remind me of uh, the, the Dominican sisters of the uh, Our Lady of the Eucharist. Yeah. Uh, their median yeah. age is still in the, the 20s. 20s and, 30s, uh, and the only reason it's that high, I think it's like 29 is because the, the, the founder and another superior are the oldest members. Right, 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 right. I, I won't guess at their age because they're frequent <laughs> guests on here, right. and that's just not wise. But uh, <laughs> but they exude evangelical youth. Yes, when they you do. See, I know, we, yes, we, they know, do. we know the sisters. Um, so we're, we're very blessed. Uh, we are laboring under a little bit of a burden. Uh, What's that? We are having difficulties housing 
uh, all of these vocations. You don't have enough room? We do not have enough room, and part of the difficulty is... May you always be smitten with this and never, ever recover. Amen. And from the rest of the seminaries, we hope the same thing happens. Uh, But we're also, uh, we have a problem with the geological situation of our grounds. About 10 years ago, we lost one-third of our high school building because of the instability, and so that building... Uh, Is it, are there earthquakes? Uh, faults, several faults that go mm-hmm. under the property. And uh, then that building and probably our Nabishit building shortly will have to be torn down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since the time those buildings were built, we've discovered we cannot build on that property without massive uh, uh, retrofitting and, uh, and digging and so we have to find a new place uh, to go. Uh, where in the past two years we've been looking for a property uh, in Orange County. Uh, people have said to us, well, why don't you leave this area? Uh, well, there are 20 million people in Southern California. Yep. And it is a culture that is easily exportable across the states. You, you alluded to that in the beginning. Mm-hmm. We want to help to Christianize that culture. And so we will stay there, and we are convinced that we will find a suitable piece of property. Uh, The hope is to build a brand-new Abbey Church, Abbey Building, Retreat House, and Prep School. Yeah, because you are not that far away from the Pacific. No. No, 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 you're fairly close. And and that in itself is problematic. That's where some of the least stable land can be for large buildings. So, you know, that's one of the things that you have to get more, a little more inland where it can be a little bit more stable. We have found the, several sites that would be ge- geologically fine. It's just Good. a matter of prayer and finances. And uh, <laughs> we have uh, uh, a part of our website. Uh, the folks can read about it. It's www.stmichaelsabbey, no apostrophe, dot com. And just look in their expansion project and uh, pray for us. Yeah, yeah. Now, one one of the reasons that St. Norbert founded your community was to preach and to get the gospel out to folks uh, at a time when there wasn't a lot. I mean, the the 11th century had been a kind of a rough period and 12th century was a time of recovery, but also a time of the Crusades. And there's a lot going on in those days. What are you doing in terms of your vocation, and in terms of the, the, the ministry. What kind of ministry do you have as, as Norbert teams? Well, our, our primary apostolate, uh, we can say, is the liturgy itself. So the solemn celebration of the Mass and the, uh, the divine office, the various hours of the liturgy of the hours. Our tradition, <clears throat> the tradition of St. Michael's Abbey in California, the external apostolate has been education. And as I mentioned, that goes back to the 1800 when our mother abbey, uh, Chorna, took up education as its apostolate. So there's that continuity. We have also always been involved in parish work. Uh, So right now we have two parishes uh, in Southern California, one in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and one in Orange, the Diocese of Orange. Uh, On any particular weekend... Our men can be found in approximately 27 parishes helping out uh, in those parishes, uh, celebrating Sunday Mass, preaching. Uh, We also have uh, a number of chaplaincies. Uh, We have the chaplaincy at Christendom College and the chaplaincy at Thomas Aquinas College uh, uh, in uh, in Ojai, uh, where chaplains... That's Ojai, California. Yes, Ojai, California, correct. And, and Christendom College, though, is on the other side right, of the country. Right, That's in right. Virginia. So from east to west, uh, our men, uh, on any particular Sunday, we would be in over 30 different locations celebrating Mass. And in five dioceses in Southern California, plus Arlington in Virginia, plus Rome, one of our men is the rector of our international college in, the, in Rome. And so uh, we really have quite, a, quite a, an expanse. The ideal in the order, though, is we join... And we take a vow of stability. And so it's a stability to the Abbey, but also stability to the place. So wherever our men are, St. Michael's Abbey, uh, that is, that's, that's the home. That's our home. And, and that would be different from, say, uh, us Jesuits. Right. <clears throat> uh, we don't have a vow of stability where we just belong to one house for our whole life. Right. We go wherever we're sent, right. whereas you would be attached to the same community sure. for your whole life, long unless it splits off and starts right. a new community. Right. Uh, like the Dominicans also. Dominicans, the same thing. The Master General can take any uh, friar and assign him anywhere. 
we are under an Abbott, and uh, we do have an Abbott Who general. happens to be you. It happens to be me. Uh, we do have an Abbott general, but his authority really is a personal one over the Abbots. So if the Abbots are not doing what they should be doing in terms of their own spiritual life, the Abbott general gets involved. Now, you know, one of the things you said is part of your apostle is the liturgy. Um, you know, this is an area where I certainly hear plenty of concerns from my, my audience because in different parts of the country, uh, sometimes the priests were trained where the liturgy should be very personalized and somewhat loose uh, in, in interpretation. Um, and then also we have another problem uh, coming up. It won't necessarily be a problem, but it'll be a, a bit of a challenge because the liturgy is going to change uh, again, but mostly in wording, not anything else. What do you see yourselves doing in terms of that apostolate of helping to regularize liturgy and helping people to get ready for this new translation of the liturgy? Historically, our founding abbot, uh, the, the first abbot, uh, Abbot Parker, he, uh, he took a stand very early on. He said, we will not reject anything in the new that is good, but we will not reject what was good in the old either. Mm -hmm. And so from the early 70s, uh, we have celebrated uh, the Mass four days a week in Latin, three days a week in, uh, uh, in English, uh, the Novus Ordo. Uh, we took a decision early on that, as the Council said, Latin and Gregorian chant enjoy a pride of place in the celebration uh, of our liturgies. In, in the Western Rite. In the Western Rite, right. correct. And that spirit is what we have taken into our two parishes that, that we now have. Our weekend assignment, people say that they can always tell a Norbertine uh, by two things when he says Mass. Uh, reverence and the homilies are good. Uh, and so two good things so, to, to be noted for. So basically that is our program, to mm -hmm. continue that work. We also provide a celebration in the extraordinary form I think in four or five places every week. And by extraordinary form, what, what, what does that mean? Because not everybody in our audience knows what that means. Three years ago, uh, Holy Father Pope Benedict issued a uh, motu proprio, a, a document uh, with his own authority, in which he said that, first of all, any priest has the right to celebrate the liturgy as it was celebrated in 1962. That is the, the mass, so-called Mass of Pius V, uh, it's actually the Mass of Gregory the Great, going back to the 5th, 6th century. And so uh, in many dioceses, bishops uh, have uh, opened the way in their diocese for the Mass to be celebrated uh, according to that rite. The Holy Father calls it the extraordinary form uh, because what well, the, the Mass that, uh, was, uh, that followed Vatican II is the ordinary form. Uh, and his personal view expressed before he became Pope was that there should be a mutual enrichment, uh, the old rite with the new. Uh, the, the new rite especially with the lectionary, the emphasis on preaching, and the old rite on that reverence and sense of the presence of God and awe that was, we can say, more easily discerned in the celebration when the priest had his, uh, was facing east and uh, celebrated Mass in a language that, that people did not know. And, and one of the things about Mass, when, it was, when the priest was facing east, uh, it's not that it was having his back to the right. people, right. Right. but he was facing in the same direction right. as the people. Right. They were all focused on Christ in the same direction rather than from two different directions. Exactly. And it's been pointed out just by that decision, uh, without any malice, Obviously, the priest is going to become more of a focal point if mm -hmm. he's facing the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the personality uh, of the priest, obviously, is going to, for better or for worse, uh, comes out uh, more readily in that, that way. Well, it, it, it's, it shows up, too, in that uh, in some churches, um, the Blessed Sacrament is sometimes removed. Right. And the reason being they want the center of attention to be the liturgical action at Mass, and some liturgists will even say that the presence of the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle is a distraction yeah. during Mass. 
uh, to which I usually respond, if Jesus is a distraction, who exactly is the main attraction here? Right, you know, right. That, but it's also a tradition that in the cathedral churches that the Eucharist was usually reserved at a side altar. And right, uh, I remember right. as a young kid going to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, and when the cardinal or one of the bishops would celebrate pontifical mass, he would come out and first go to the altar where the blessed sacrament was uh, reposed, pray there, and then proceed. So there is, there, there is a tradition for that. Uh, but unfortunately, as you say, um, in some ways people have begun to think, well, you know, this is, this is secondary or this is not important or... Right, right. I've been renaming some of those churches, Father. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we will uh, not I, ask what you... <laughs> well, I, I, I call them the churches of St. Mary Magdalene. Well, she's the one who said they've taken away my Lord, Lord and I know not where they placed him. So that's what I'm saying. So this is uh, uh, going to be a, a, a new emphasis, too, for you. Uh, will you take on... You know the helping to train people with this new translation oh, sure, of the liturgy, certainly, certainly. so that'll be part of your work, right? Right. And first and foremost, our own seminarians. We do uh, all the novitiate uh, novitiate classes and philosophy classes at the Abbey, and then for theology from the 1970s, from the time when we were uh, students, all of our men have, have gone to Rome and lived in our generalate there and studied most of us at the Angelicum. Okay. Father James... Which is the, which is the school of the Dominican, the Dominican Fathers. Fathers. And Father mm-hmm. James is the first member of our community who started out as a freshman in high school and persevered. Maybe you want to tell us a little bit about the, your, your journey there. Tell us about that, Father. When the Norbertines arrived in Southern California in 1957, my parents and family met them through the Cardinal Menzendi Foundation and my parents became very friendly and supportive of uh, Father Parker, the future Abbot Parker. And from 1957 to 1960 the seven Hungarians worked very hard and saved what money they could and in 1960 as Father Abbot mentioned they bought the piece of land that we were on right now in Orange County. In the meantime, I was discerning a vocation to the priesthood. I was in grade school at the time, serving Mass at my local parish, and contacting all of the different religious orders in Southern California, receiving their brochures and information and so on. And when it was time for high school, I enrolled in the high school seminary, the junior seminary, there at St. Michael's. And I was a high school student from 1964 to 1968. And by that time, I had realized that God was blessing me with a calling, a vocation, to the Norbertine Order at this particular location at St. Michael's. So in 1968... I became a Norbertine. I joined the novitiate and got the white habit. Same year I knew the Jesuits, in fact. Okay. Uh, we're, we're all kids the same That's age. Right. Yes. And, and, and now you're one of the kids who really made good. Uh, you're the uh, sub-prior. Yes. So <laughs> see how they grow up so fast. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I need to take a break. Sure. Yes. Uh, we're going to come back. I just want to let you, remind you all that if you want to find out more about their abbey and the work that they're doing there, which is really is terrific, you can go to www.stmichaelsabbey.com. And that's just one word, St. Michael's Abbey. Saint is just S-T. St. Michael's Abbey.com, and you can find out more about them. But we also want to get your questions and your comments, so please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back. We have a wonderful audience here. Some folks right from Birmingham, Alabama, as well as folks from California and uh, Missouri and a few other states as well, Texas. So we'd love to have you come and join us. If you can come as a family or come as an individual or if you want to get a group from your parish or, or your city, you're more than welcome to come over here. Just contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll help with all kinds of information about where you can stay, scheduling for mass, scheduling for tours of the network and programs here. And uh, they'll let you know all the good restaurants to eat. How many of you had fried green tomatoes? Oh, there's a bunch. Okay, good, good. Were they any good? Yeah. See, it's not like fried green tomatoes. It's so good. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, we'd love to have you all come down here and visit us because it's a lot of fun to have you in the studio audience. Well, fathers, are you ready for some questions? Yes. Sure. All right, let's start off with a call. We have John on the line. Hello, John. Hello, fathers. Hi, where are you from? Uh, Ohio. Great. And what's your question? Uh, I want everybody to pray for these good fathers so they can uh, have their new place to live. Uh, I'm wondering what the priests would share about living in such a community, what the advantages would be having so many mostly priests gathered together. It's my first question. And the second question would be, I'm a little confused. It's called an abbey, and you have an abbot, but you say you're not monks. Are you not monks because you don't have a rule of enclosure? And I will hang up. Thank you. This guy has some good questions here. Yes. So, yes. so why are you an abbot? Well, let's go to the, the first question okay. about living together. Sure. Uh, that was one of the great insights of St. Norbert, as Father James uh, alluded to, um, that when priests live together, And this goes back actually to St. Augustine. When St. Augustine became Bishop of Hippo, he said, I will have a monastery of clerics. So in the Augustinian tradition, we've always been clerics living a monastic monastic life, monastic rule. Uh, But the great advantage is that we call each other to fidelity and we are accountable to each other for how we are living our... uh, religious, canonical, and monastic vocation. Right from the beginning, one of the things that St. Norbert said was that any community that takes care of its guests, practices cleanliness around the altar, and confesses their sins and faults daily in chapter, that community will never want for vocations. And so the advantage right now, in this day and age, when there is so much temptation so much possible uh, causes of a falling away from one's uh, true calling. This is a great grace. And the young people that come to visit, invariably, they're there because they want to be priests with other priests and have that priestly support. Also, something that you brought up in that answer is the importance of uh, confessing one's faults to each other. Um, You know, a good deal of what we get from the media from California is that narcissism, self-centeredness, and mm. selfish immorality are okay. Not that, not that they promote violent ones always, but I'm thinking of the sitcoms. Right. The sitcoms of the last 20 years have all been about narcissism and self-centeredness and selfish, you know, self-indulgence. There's a lot of self in there. Um, how you sound like you're a counter sign right. to that Definitely. whole culture by having you know not defending your faults but admitting them and confessing sure, sure, them sure. and that goes back to original sin we all have that uh, ingrained uh, tendency and weakness and we like to think our daily life reminds us it's not about us it's about god it's about the brethren it's about the people we serve. Mm-hmm. And uh, St. Norbert, there, there is a man who had the wisdom of the ages, that he, he speaks as much today to us as he did uh, to his first followers in the 12th century. The second point he made was about <clears throat> abbot and monk. Uh, the, 
there is a, a two, two-fold tradition. There is this monastic lay movement, and there's a monastic clerical movement. So when we look at the beginnings of uh, the Desert Fathers and Benedictine monasticism, these were lay movements who had priests as they were needed. Augustine begins something new. He wants to combine that monastic discipline with the clerical life, uh, that support and spiritual program with the care of souls. And so from 5th century, 6th century, there is that tradition of also clerical uh, monasticism, which is revitalized in the 11th and 12th centuries with the rise of this canon regular movement, the movement of the canons regular, which uh, the Norbertines' Paramount's detentions would be the w- one of the few groups that has lasted since uh, the 12th century. Yeah, yeah that's that's a, a a great gift, and um, you know I, I I think of the importance of uh, the distinction between canon and, and monk is, is good to keep highlighted, mm-hmm. but uh, the word abbot comes from the Hebrew word avot, which means fathers. And also uh, uh, the Greek word, too, I think. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, not no, Greek. No, uh, no it's not Abbas. Greek. That'd, that'd be uh, uh, patres. But one of, one of the, uh, the Syrian or, well... It, the well, well it's, Syrian is a form of uh, Northwest Semitic, so yeah. it would be Syriac, Hebrew, uh, and Aramaic, and Chaldean. That avot, uh, the word for father is a funny word because normally... The male, the masculine plural would be I am, like avim, but it has the feminine plural, even though it's a masculine noun. It's a very odd. And then there's some feminine nouns, like the word for woman has a masculine ending. Interesting. I, some languages are odd. And then, of course, Jesus calls his father Abba. Right, so, exactly. So, so, exactly. so the, these exactly. are all, it's all tied exactly. together. All right. Well, let's go to a question Good. from our studio audience. Miss, where are you from? St. Louis, Missouri. Great. Good to have you here. And what is your question? My question is, could you please explain head coverings for women during church? Head coverings for women in church. Why do women cover their heads well, I, that like is, nuns do? That goes back to St. Paul, I think. He uh, 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 exhorted the women in those first Christian communities to not be vain, uh, to be not concerned so much about how they look, how they appear, mm-hmm. uh, how they appeal to men. Uh, and I think that was just a very practical way for him to uh, to sort of uh, give a... Uh, a means to live that out. Uh, certainly, women's religious life, we've had uh, uh, that tradition very much ingrained in us and that uh, it has become a sign of consecration. So in the rite uh, for the consecration of a virgin, uh, which may be different from, from women religious uh, in many cases, uh, they give a veil and a ring. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the current situation. Uh, and, of course, uh, there are a number of places where women continue to wear a covering uh, on their heads. Yeah, it's, it's a sign of modesty, and, you know, it's, it's one in which we, uh, you know, uh, not try not to spend as much time on the hair when you're going to church. I mean, um, it's not just women that can do that. I mean, we had a presidential candidate that was spending $400 on a haircut. I don't know who his barber was, but it sounds like a scam. But, uh, you know, I I get him for 15 bucks, you know. Seven. Of course, I don't have as much to cut. But the the narcissism. I didn't know they get discounts on that. That's good. (laughs) Narcissism of the age. That's also part of it. The men can be as vain and as prone to. Absolutely. But we don't cover our heads. We just have to grow up. All right. We have another caller. We have Joe on the line. Hello, Joe. Hi, uh, I was just wondering if uh, St. Norbert had any other mystical experiences aside from St. Augustine, and what is he the patron saint of? Thank so, you. So of what is St. Norbert a patron? The Eucharist. The Eucharist. He's one of the patrons of the Eucharist in the Piazza of St. Peter's. Uh, he's, his statue is in one of, one of the many uh, there, and he's holding a lot for monstrance. Okay. Uh, uh, the beginning iconography of St. Norbert showed him with the Bible because he was a man of the word. Right, but then great, great preacher. As, as time went on, and in, shortly after his own uh, passing, uh, the Eucharistic heresies 
uh, we, he, but also our, our order was involved with preaching the true doctrine about the Eucharist. Right, because Berengarius in the right, late 11th right, century right. started then, the first Eucharistic And then heresy. there was uh, Tom Kelm, uh, a heretic that uh, St. Norbert uh, uh, defeated verbally and spiritually. Uh, in those uh, portrayals of St. Norbert with the Eucharist, there's usually someone at his foot looking very diabolical, and that re- represents Tal- Tonkelm, whom uh, whose uh, heresy he defeated. And um, in, in terms of this also, you, you seem to be a great historian of St. Hubert, no, St. Norbert. Um, what would be some of the more mystical elements of his own life? The reason that St. Norbert chose this isolated uh, valley of Premontre is because he asked the bishop, his host, that he, St. Norbert, could spend the night there alone in prayer. During the middle of the night, St. Norbert saw a vision of our Lord on the cross in the middle of this valley. Premontre is a cross-shaped valley to begin with. And he saw future members of his order wearing white habits and carrying liturgical instruments from the edges of the valley towards the center. And that to him was a sign from God that this place is where God wants him to be. And that was very surprising to Bishop Bartholomew, to the local noble people. It was a uh, marsh area. Not too many people lived there or wanted to live there. That would bring down property values. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) St. Norbert also had a vision of Our Lady when he was in the process of formalizing his order and choosing a habit, St. Norbert received a vision of Our Lady who handed him a white habit. And that, again, that was a sign from God that this would be the habit uh, that we wear. There's also... And, and that would be the, the this, kind of this habit, habit that you two you Yes, wear. a tunic, which was worn uh, already, and uh, the scapular. I think St. Norbert was one of the first to have a white scapular over the white tunic. And I notice that yours is very white. Very and yours white. is a little off white. <laughs> yes. It has nothing to do with <laughs> no. no okay. Either just... internal or external. No, we no. Uh, <laughs> we are we're blessed with great benefactors and when you have the habit made, the, the shade is determined by what free free material we have to make them. So <laughs> Father enough. Father's was made a little bit uh, before mine was, but this is the current model. Okay. There you go. We have another question here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Los Angeles, California, Father. And you are kinfolk to one of our brothers. Is that not correct? <laughs> yes, I am, Father. Father Brother, Brother Leonard, Leonard is your yes. son. Yes, Father. Thank you for sharing him with us. He's a great man. We really like him. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. So, so what's your question? F- Father, in most, in most orders, it takes from 10 to 12 years to become a priest. In your order, is that the same? Yeah, how long does it take to... In our community at St. Yes. Michael's Abbey, it takes about 10 years okay. average. Now, that might be shortened by a year or two in certain cases. For example, if a candidate has already had some seminary training mm-hmm. or religious training in another community, then that might be shortened by a year or two. But it's broken down into a four-month postulancy Four months as a postulant. What, what is a postulant? Because we have postulants running around here. Yes. They're about to get a habit as uh, okay. novices. Yes. So what is a postulant? postulant lives at the Abbey. He prays, works with us for four months. This gives him uh, a very intimate experience into our life. Uh, the, the postulants watch us closely. We watch them, especially the formation priest. But they do not take any vows. They don't make any commitment. So they still would own their own property and yes. all that. Yes, and they are free to leave on good terms if they feel called to a different vocation or a different community. Okay. After four months, they start a novi- the novitiate, which lasts for a year and eight months. So the postulancy and the novitiate together are, are two, two years. years. And then they start taking their temporary vows. And then again, depending on how far the person is in their formation 
and their education. Uh, those vows might be longer or shorter in different cases, but they end up with solemn vows, solemn perpetual profession. In the meantime, our seminarians study their two years of Christian philosophy at the Abbey. So they're at the Abbey for four years. Then we send them away for four years of theology. Sometime during that four-year period, they will be called back to the Abbey for a full year to work usually in our educational apostolate, usually mm-hmm. there at the Abbey School. Okay. And then they go on for theology and they get ordained after that. Yes. So it's usually about 10 years. Yeah. You know, you heard about the lady whose son went to the seminary and she told the pastor with great joy. I said, well, which one did he go to? She didn't know. I said, well, if he's going to be a diocesan priest, he'll be there for eight years. If he's going to be a Dominican or a pre detention, he'll be there for 10 years. If he's going to be a judge, he'll be there for 13 years. And the lady said, oh, I'm sure he's going to be a Jesuit. He's always been a very slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> we have a caller named Nora. Hello, Nora. Hi. Hi, where are you from? San Pedro, California. Oh, great. Good to have you there, Nora. The outskirts of Los Angeles. Exactly. I know where, I know where it is. Great little area. Now, what's your question tonight? My question to the father is, I wanted to know if there's um sisterhood order to the Norbertines. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Do you have the Norbertine sisters? Again, Father Jim mentioned that uh, one of the things that, that Norbert brought about was there was this massive movement of people to this call to sanctity, and Norbert had as many as many women as men who followed. Uh, one of his biographers said, no man since the apostolic life, the age of the apostles, has attracted more women to that closer following of Christ, which is religious life. And so from the beginning, uh, there were double monasteries, and then about 20 years after the foundation of the order, it was decided that they should be separated and that the sisters would have an elected internal superior and there would be a priest from the abbey who would serve as the, the provost. Today, uh, there are probably about 200 sisters uh, who are members of the order. And in 1996-97, St. Michael's Abbey began to work with a group of women who felt they were being called uh, to Norbertine uh, life as sisters. Uh, there were never any houses in the United States, and we began to work with them. Uh, they've spent an efficient year in a monastery, a Dominican monastery in New York. Uh, and then they spent about six months traveling, visiting all of the houses of the order in Europe. Uh, they came back, and then we purchased some property, and now they have grown from five to 20. So well, that's pretty good growth. Very good. That's and, excellent growth. And we are in the process now of uh, uh, Bishop Steinbach has been very welcoming and supportive. They're, they're Bishop very, Steinbach is Fresno, where? Fresno, Fresno. Fresno. So that's about a three-hour drive uh, from where we are. But in the years since they've been in that place, since 2000, they have had mass every day uh, from a confrere of, of St. Michael's Abbey. You know, a lot of times you hear people say that you know, the religious orders of women are just all dying out. No. That's not the case. No. And these sisters wanted to live and want to live the fullness of the Norbertine life. So we're penitential, but they are super penitential. They get up at midnight every, every evening, every night. They pray the office of, uh, of matins, of, of the readings, uh, and then they're up again by five thirty, six o'clock. They celebrate all of the, the hours. Uh, they are contemplatives. Uh, they are enclosed for the most part. Uh, they have a guest facility, a very limited one. And, uh, but for the most part, they really, they, they are living that hidden life uh, that the church has always held in such great, uh, great esteem. Well, you know, it's, it's going to be re- really great for your order because, you know, the, the more contemplative orders, uh, my, my dad used to say, well, what a waste. They, all they do is sit around and pray. And I, I told him, Dad, the battery of a car doesn't move, but you don't get the car started without it. Right. And we need, you know, people, holy women, holy men praying for us. And the Carmelites do that, and your sisters are doing the same. Yeah. Ask them to toss me some. Okay. Okay. We have another question. Sir, where are you from? Ontario, California. Oh, it's a great area. And what is your question? 
Uh, what are some of the unique challenges facing a young man wishing to join your order? The, the spirit of the time, first of all, that, that they would get to the point, that a young man would get to the point that he feels the call from God. That in itself is a great work of grace. That, mm-hmm. That's clear that, that our specific way of life, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our primary external uh, apostolate is education. So the uh, expectation is, though we, not all of us teach at any particular time, that the confer has to be prepared and able to teach. So there's an educational uh, uh, barrier to, to jump there. Yeah, you, you can't just sort of, you know, be playing video games all day long and then say, well, I'm going to be a priest. Right. I mean, you have to know what you're talking about. And, uh, and of course, educational psychology and discipline has changed. When uh, our founding fathers came uh, and were accepted into Los Angeles, they had a language challenge. Uh, because they, they spoke Hungarian. Hungarian. Uh, they, had, they had, of course, a financial uh, pressure. Uh, but our founding abbot told us he was assigned to teach biology. And he was a man of letters. He had a doctor in theology. He was a man of literature. And he said he kept ahead of the students one week. So he would read the chapter, teach it the next week. So uh, that obviously is not the situation anymore. No, and as no. Father mentioned, uh, when we have this apostolic year, the young men are expected to teach. And obviously we give them some formation for that. Good. The other challenges are the challenges of today, I think. Sure. To sure. say no to self, to say yes to the brethren, to God. Uh, we have another question. Sister, where are you from? I am from the Sister Servants of the Eternal Word down the road. We have a retreat house. Yeah, and just I, about a mile and a half away from here. Just about a mile and a half away. And we, I, I would like Abbot Hayes to speak about the retreat work that the Norbertines do. For the last um, five years, the Norbertine priests have given our eight-day annual community retreat, and we're terribly grateful for that generosity, and we've benefited enormously. They're just beautiful, balanced, spiritual, deeply spiritual um, retreats. So I'd wonder if, if the Norbertines do other retreat work around the country. First of all, thank you to, to Sister for her kind words. Uh, good to see you here, Sister, too. And uh, our men that have gone have come back always edified by the yes. life that the sisters are living. Uh, and what is happening more and more, it is not unusual for us to get a request. So Southern California Sisters Group here in uh, in Alabama. Uh, we give retreats regularly to uh, groups of sisters in Canada. Uh, we have been giving retreats to a diocese in, in uh, a Dawson Priest in one of the dioceses of Canada. Uh, we just get, had more... Which diocese is that? Kamloops. 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 I gave a retreat to them, too. I thought it might be Kamloops. And then this past year, one of our conferences went and gave the retreat to the priests of Vancouver, yes. uh, who is... Uh, uh, Archbishop Miller. Miller. Uh, and he was just in Atlanta a few mo- couple months ago. And they, uh, the way they do it there is that there are two retreats, two consecutive weeks, same retreat. First week, half of the priests come. Second week, the other half come. And the Archbishop wrote a very, very nice letter and very complimentary. Yeah. So as the word has gotten out, we are doing more and more retreats. Uh, every year we have... Uh, an annual meeting of all the psalm we professed. And at this last uh, chapter, I said, how many of us the past year had either done days of recollection or retreats? And the number was about 15, 15 out of the 50. Well, you know, one of the things I like uh, in hearing from you tonight is that there's so much positive energy going forward. You know, like uh, George Weigel said about Pope John Paul, uh, he did not have a rearview mirror in his car. You know, you're moving forward, you know, and, and that, that sense of moving forward of expansion and growth and, and the various missions, this is a great thing for us to be hearing about, and I appreciate it very much that you've been able to join us tonight. Now, I'm going to ask you a favor, though. Sure. Uh, I'm going to ask you to join me in giving a blessing sure. to our, our studio artists sure. because I'm afraid we've come just about to the end of the show. Uh, but it's been really a delight to have you here. So if you would join me in giving a blessing, may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lead you in all of your ways by His peace and direct you in, his, by, in your paths. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And again... 
you know, you've been really great uh, over the last few weeks. We've mentioned that we've had, you know, some financial strain because of the economy and everything else. And you've been responding and we're getting out of that hole. We still have a little ways to go, but we would appreciate if you continue to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. We're getting almost out of that, that financial hole. Then that happens a lot of summer times because everybody's traveling and stuff and forgets to contribute. But uh, we'd appreciate your help very much because this network has always, always been brought to you by you. You're our family, and we want to be able to provide this for you. So God bless you, and thank you for your great generosity.